Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Today's guest is Simran Jeet Singh, author of Fauja Singh Keeps Going. This beautifully illustrated picture book tells the true story of Fauja Singh, who broke world records to become the first 100-year-old to run a marathon. This book shares valuable lessons on the source of its grit, determination to overcome obstacles, and the commitment to positive representation of the Sikh community. Now, let's join Nimrata Tripathi in conversation with author Simran G. Singh. Hi, Simran. Hi, Namrata. Uh, I'm so happy to be able to do this with you today. It's like uh, um, to have a moment of connection in the middle of all of this feels like such a gift. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, even just even just sitting down and thinking about things, right, I, that are um, that are different from the things that are constantly occupying our minds. It's, it's a nice, it's a nice escape to think about something that's, that's meaningful, but also different. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think today we'll probably try to talk about a a bunch of things ranging from your book, um, for Jesse and keeps going, which is the true story of the oldest person to ever run a marathon. And then also about sort of your work in general as a sort of an activist and scholar and educator writer, um, and of course, I want to hear about all of the stuff that you've been up to recently and how you're kind of processing the events of the world today. I mean, I think from what I hear, it, like, it seems like where everyone begins is, you know, how are you doing? I don't even know how one answers that question. Do you even want to take a shot at that? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, you're right. That's that's the standard question. And we all have our standard responses. And I'm I'm actually kind of um embarrassed to admit how how well i'm doing in this moment because you know a lot of it comes from from my own privilege and um mm-hmm. and and to be able to say this is this has been a moment of of connection for for my family uh spending more time with our girls um even i mean we were infected with covid and so there, there were some scary moments um mm-hmm. that we dealt with and so even through all of that, um, we feel very fortunate and blessed. And so um, I'm actually, uh, yeah, a, a little bit embarrassed to say that I'm doing quite well at a time when I know so many people aren't. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, mm-hmm. really, really feel for them. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I feel like not just doing well, I feel like you're really trying to I don't know, I feel like you're everywhere. You're sort of really engaged with your community, with broader communities. I feel like you do a lot of sort of um, inter-community uh, dialogue and things like this, right? And now you started this new podcast as well, which I wanted to ask you about a little bit. Mm-hmm. I know that's not what we're here for, to be on one podcast and talk about another, but I can't help myself. Um, and so you started this podcast, right, called Becoming Less Racist, Lighting the Path to Anti-Racism. And I want to talk a little bit about that, just sort of, you know, where that came from. And also, especially the title, which I know you have some, you have a very intentional sort of thinking behind, because when I first saw it too, I was like, what is this title? But then I read kind of what you were thinking. So tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the, the, the name of the program is intentionally provocative. Um, you know, I, 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 believe, I believe a few things about, about racial justice, and I've been working in that space for, for quite some time right now. Um, but, but I think one of the things that, that, I, that, that frustrates me in, in our conversations about racism is, is we always point the finger to other people, mm-hmm. um, and you know, when, when when the entire world is pointing their finger elsewhere, um, nobody's ever taking responsibility for for racism. Um, and so, you know, a lot of our research around unconscious bias um, and and how we think about race tells us that we all have these racist ideas embedded within our own minds. Um, and I wanted to, that to be the premise of of the conversation, in part because I found that when we can all own that um, and agree to that, it requires a lot of vulnerability. Um, it's deeply uncomfortable. Once we own that, then, then we can actually um, get somewhere in terms of addressing the racism all around us, but also the racist ideas within ourselves. And so mm-hmm. I, that, that's part of the title. And then the other thing I really wanted to do was, um, I, I didn't want it to feel like becoming less racist is the goal. 
um, right. right? Like <laughs> we, we, right, have to, exactly. we have to set the bar higher than that. And so, so that's where I, it was very important to me that, that we bring in this idea of anti-racism. And, and that mm -hmm. comes from uh, this quote that really changed my own thinking on this from Angela Davis, who, mm -hmm. who said that in a, in a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We must be mm -hmm. anti-racist. And, and that's, mm -hmm. that's been a really important part of my own politics and, and my mm -hmm. spiritual formation as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That I think is a perfect segue because I wanted to ask you about your um, political work and beliefs, of your activism, and and the intersection with your spiritual beliefs, because I think all of those things are really interrelated in your work and, and are such a big part of this book, right? Um, For Justin Keeps Running. And I've been thinking recently about sort of the act of running as well, and how it relates to kind of what's going on now in a way that I had never thought of before. And maybe think of this quote, um, uh, and you probably know who said it, because I don't remember, but that marching is praying with your feet. Um, and that is running an extension of that. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the book and if, if that was something that you were thinking as you're working on it. Yeah, it's a, it's a great um, question. And it, you know, that, that quote um, uh, comes from Rabbi Heschel who, mm -hmm. joined, uh, who joined Martin Luther King um, on the march from Selma to Montgomery uh, at the height of the civil rights era. Um, and the story goes that when, when Rabbi Heschel um, returned from Selma, uh, someone asked him, uh, I, I don't know what the tone was, but, but the question was, did you find any time to pray while you were there? Mm. And, and mm. Rabbi Heschel's response was, I prayed with my feet. And it's, it's such a powerful, um, it's such a powerful response, I think, because so often we think about spirituality being internal and, and prayer being something that's interiorized, that it's just for us. Um, and for me, I really resonate with, with the views of, of Rabbi Heschel and Dr. King, who lived in a very similar way, um, and Fo Jessing, the, the subject of this book, who, who also uh, resonates a lot with this idea that um, to be a truly connected person uh, that means to be connected internally uh, with yourself and, and your spirit, um, mm -hmm. but also to be connected with, with the people around you. And, and that draws a lot from, from the Sikh teachings um, that describe um, that a truly, a truly religious person is someone who we describe as a sansibai, somebody who is a saint and a soldier at all times. And, and you know, Foja Singh's name actually um, reflects that, Foja Foja refers to a soldier and, and a warrior. And so uh, it's just this beautiful um, expression of, of what it really looks like to be, to be connected. When, when I was talking to Foja saying about, about this book and asking him about running and what it meant to him, he, he said that um, when he runs, that's when he feels closest mm. to divinity. Um, and he said that running made him more spiritually aware uh, and more in tune with himself. And so there, there's something really interesting about um, the connection between um, our, our physical bodies um, and the spirits within us that, that I think we often forget about. And, and I, I, I believe that because I felt it personally as I've started running, mm -hmm. uh, inspired by Foja saying, you know, I, I felt uh, a different kind of spiritual connection, but also a different orientation uh, towards justice and, and connection with people. And, and I, you know, the last thing I'll say is it, it, it really boils down for me into this, into this idea that I, I, I love, okay, so Dr. Cornell West says it in probably the most poignant way that I've seen. Um, he says that justice is what love looks like in public. Mm. And, and what that means to me when he, when he says that is, love we think about as this, again, this interiorized feeling that's inside of us, but, but we all know because we've all felt it, that love is what moves us into action, mm -hmm. um, right? Like if you're, if you're a parent, um, you do things for your kids because you love them, right? You don't just sit around and, and think about them. You're, you're, you're moved to do something. And, and so this idea of love and spirituality being at the core of this movement, whether it's Rabbi Heschel or Dr. King or Cornell West or, or Foy Jessing, right? I think, I think the active, the activeness of love, 
um, and, and, and the spirit is, is a really powerful, a really powerful force in this world. So Simran, I would love to hear you um, maybe talk a little bit about um, your experience of seeing Fawja run, how that inspired you as a runner. Um, and you and I have talked a little bit in the past about, you know, um, how rare it is to see Sikhs represented in, in sport, definitely in the West, right? And in literature. Yeah, sure. So I, I'll start by saying that growing up in, in South Texas, where um, there weren't, there really weren't any people who looked like me there, right? Like as a turban wearing, uh, brown skinned, uh, beard having <laughs> um, kid. And I, you know, my brothers and me were the only ones uh, in the entire region. Um, and, you know, we, we, I remember how badly we always wanted to, um, to find books with characters who look like us just so we could show our friends um, mm -hmm. that, you know, we're not, we're not as strange or as foreign as, as you might think. Um, and so I, that, that was always a dream. And I remember always being disappointed. Um, and, and 30 years later, when my daughter was born, um, you know, I went back to the children's book sections and, and nothing had changed. And, and that was a really, um, it was disappointing and also really painful realization to, to think about what it would mean for my kids to grow up um, receiving all these negative messages about people who look like me without ever, they would never receive a counter message of something positive. Um, they would never see someone who looked like their father uh, as, as potentially a, a hero. And, and so that, that was the time when I, I really got to the question of how do I tell uh, a story about, about sex? And, and as I was reflecting on my own experiences, um, I, I kept coming back to the story of Foja Singh. Uh, you know, here is, here is a person who uh, has so many life lessons for us just in his own uh, inspiring story of, of running and, and what that meant to him and, and what he accomplished, um, what, that, what lessons we take away in terms of, in terms of perseverance um, and hard work. I think those are, those are really important for, for what we teach our kids. Um, but also what really drew me into his story was thinking about how so many aspects of his experience um, could help us humanize those who we tend to think of as different. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, here's someone who was born uh, on the other side of the world in, in Punjab, um, who was born in a village in a lower class family who had a disability uh, growing up, wasn't able to walk, who was illiterate, uh, who never went to school. Mm -hmm. um, and someone who, um, someone who raised a family with all of those things, not in spite of them, but they, they were a part of who he was. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to really capture those aspects of his identity as, as human, as something we can all value and respect, that was really important to me. The other part of the story that really drew me in um, was, was thinking about the challenges of, of xenophobia uh, and racism that six experience and, and giving, giving voice to that in some way. And, and Voja did that mm -hmm. in such a beautiful uh, in such a beautiful way where he, he used his gift for running as a way to, to address the injustices and the violence that six were experiencing in America. And, and I wanted to talk openly about racism um, as something that's, that's something that we don't discuss often enough with our kids, mm -hmm. uh, but to do it in a way that, that was still fully human. I think one of my frustrations is that so often um, when, when our stories are told, uh, they end up being dehumanizing because they're so flattened, right? We're presented as, as victims who have uh, no agency, we're helpless, we're powerless. And, and here's this beautiful man who was so powerful, right? Like he was able to run a marathon at the age of 100, right? That's mm -hmm. such he an started running story. when he was in his 80s? Is and he started right? running as, when he was in, yeah. So as, as I a, plan to start in about 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I think I think that's one of the the inspiring uh, aspects of it. I think too, like it's never it's never too late. Um, a lot of older folks have have come to me and said, as as I've shared his story, like they take so much inspiration from him. Uh, not just that he was running at the age of a hundred, 
uh, but that he started something new at the age of 80, in his mm-hmm. 80s, at the age of 81. And I think for our kids, it's, it's really important for us to show um, that people at that age can also be our heroes. I think ageism mm-hmm. is, a real, is a real problem in our society where we tend to uh, denigrate or dehumanize people who are older or elderly. Um, and so that, that, I think, is a really powerful lesson as well. Mm-hmm. And you worked with Fuad Jessing on this book. Um, uh, maybe you can talk about that first meeting with him. Yeah, sure. So the, the very first time I met him, um, he was about 102. Uh, he had come to the States for, for a tour. He was still running then. Um, and I, I went down to D.C. Uh, to go meet him because I just, I just had to. Um, and we had about 15, 15 minutes together and uh, it was so powerful. He was, um, you know, he was energetic and dynamic and he was laughing a ton and cracking jokes, right? Like not what you would expect from somebody at that age, mm-hmm. uh, but he's so full of life. And um, we had started a running club here in New York uh, in his honor. Uh, it was called the, the Surat Fulge. Um, the Surat Foj Running Club, and we had done all sorts of events, and, and our logo was a silhouette of him running. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were able to present him with that shirt. And so it was, it was just this really touching experience. Um, and, you know, we talked a lot about his life experiences, and I was trying to gain wisdom from him. Um, and, and at one, one moment, I asked him if he had any regrets. And, and, and he looked at me, and, and I could see his face like a a little bit of pain in his eyes Uh, and he was Mm. saying I I wish I had done more uh, for young people uh, to inspire them uh, to touch their lives and um, yeah I'll never forget that that look in his face and and I walked away um, thinking that I I wanted to do something for him given how much he had done for the rest of us and how much he had done for me personally Um, but I also wanted to to share his story with the world because I think there's so much we can all gain from it. Mm-hmm. And so then you wrote a children's book about it, and this is your first children's book. Um, so maybe tell me a little bit about what that process was like for you. I mean, I'm putting you a little bit on the spot because I'm your editor on the book, so I guess <laughs> this is probably a bit unfair. Maybe you can talk about what it was like to work with Baljinder, the illustrator on the book, and just yeah, what it was like to approach children's literature for the first time if there are any big surprises that came up for you yeah i mean this is probably one you get a lot namrita but i think mm-hmm. the 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 uh the first big surprise came with how hard it was to write mm, um, yep I hear that a lot. <laughs> as, as someone who uh who had prided himself as a writer you know i'm a scholar and have written thousands of pages of stuff that no one's ever read <laughs> um yeah, I, th- I thought I would come in and, and write a book in a day and submit it and be done. And um, and to to I was really humbled uh, by the process and and learned a ton and gained a lot of appreciation for for the craft itself. Um, and so that that was the first big surprise. Um, the process, I mean, I I couldn't have enjoyed it more. I, I worked with. Um, two really talented, smart people, um, you know, yourself, which was um, a delight, and, and, and my agent, Tanushri uh, mm-hmm. Prasanna, who was also fantastic. And I, I mean, to be totally frank, and I'm, I'm guessing I'm not the only one, um, the, the initial version of the text that I had written um, is quite different from, from how the book turned out. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and it's not to say, you know, it's a nonfiction biography. So it's, it's not uh, to say that we changed his story. Um, but there were things that we um, improved, you know, we, we changed the, the, the climactic moment of the story, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we brought in details from his life that made it come to life a bit more. So those kinds of things. Um, I, yeah, it was just a really fun eye-opening process. And, um, and the other thing I'll say is working with the illustrator was also... Um, the illustrator is Berlin Dercor, who's an, an artist based in the UK. He's an artist based in the UK. And um, I remember, um, Namrata, when you asked if I had anyone who I would, who I would want to work with, mm-hmm. and I had been following Belgender on Instagram for, for a long time at that point. Um, and... Uh, 
and, and there were two things, I mean, that really drew me in. One was um, the idea of working with someone who understood um, the details without me having to explain them, like having mm -hmm. someone else from a Punjabi Sikh background right. who also lived in the UK, like for just saying, like she knew him in a way that no one else would. And so that, that made things so much less burdensome on my part because I didn't have to do, it's not just that I didn't have to do heavy lifting. It's that I, I completely trusted um, that how she would represent him would be authentic to him and to me and to the community I was trying to, to show. And so uh, that ended up proving to be quite true. I mean, I, <laughs> I remember her submitting the art and, and you sharing it with me and, um, asking if I had any edits. And I think the only thing I said in the entire book was there was one font color that I didn't like in the art. <laughs> Which is not even <laughs> virgin, there's probably to fix. But yeah, I mean, I think one of the right. things that we always look for, you know, in a picture book collaboration is that both the author and the illustrator are storytellers in the making of the book, mm. right? It's not like the illustrator simply draws the pictures for your words because they are an equal partner. They're adding a layer of storytelling and depth and nuance and joy. In the few people who I've shown the illustrations to so far, um, those who are from within the Punjabi Sikh community, like that's exactly what they pointed out. That mm -hmm. um, the, there, there's a scene in the book where he's tying his turban Mm -hmm. um, and like no one, no one would be able to capture that uh, in the same way as someone who knows what that looks like. And and for those who are on the inside, it's like, oh, this is not just someone else telling my story. This is us. Like this is really right. us. So the authenticity is is different. And I think um, I, I think that's not that that wouldn't have been possible. It's not just having an artist who's who's Punjabi. Like I. I think that the way it worked out was, you know, my, my agent is South Asian, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're South Asian. And, and so. And, and for the sick mother. Right, right, exactly. And, and so the, um, and so the, the, the close knowledge of what this looks like, I mean, it would, it would be easy to imagine that in another context um, you hire or someone else hires an artist who's, South Asian, but doesn't know Punjabi culture, which is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. different. And like, no, no one would be able to, um, no one would be able to know what it, what it would look like to comb your sick son's hair mm -hmm. other than, other than a Punjabi, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's the daily ritual. It's what, how I That's used right. to, yeah. We, we, growing up in Texas, my mom used to have the four of us lined up. <laughs> the four brothers and then we would all do that and we would watch each yeah. other right so it was, yeah, it was yeah. really intimate it's beautiful That's great now i think there's also part of the bookmaking process that is outside of our experience right there was so much that was very much inside and then there's parts of it that are outside and i think for the, a lot of the conversations we had were in really thinking about um uh talking about and representing Fawja's full self which included sort of his experience with disability and can you maybe talk a little bit about sort of our process there and sort of um you know what we learned along the way oh yeah i'll, I'll be honest about it it was it was a surprising moment for me um mm -hmm. you know I, i'm someone who works in the diversity and inclusion space professionally um and i uh like to think um that i <laughs> that I have all the answers in that world. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as we as we got into uh, the the aspects of disability and started, I mean, we had written it. Um, and I remember uh, sending you an email number at the, uh, sending you an email being like this, something about this seems off, but I don't know how to fix it. Um, and, and you emailed back and you, you had said something similar that like you, you, were, you noticed the same thing and, and we weren't quite sure how to deal with it. Um, yeah, I, it was, it was this moment where I was like, oh no, I, I, I don't know everything in this space. And, and you made this suggestion of bringing in, uh, disability consultants to think through it. Um, and I mean, the, the specific question was, um, we didn't want to fall into the trope of telling the story as if uh, hard work gets you through a disability, um, which would then imply that 
um, people who have disabilities and haven't quote unquote overcome them are just lazy, right? They're not trying hard enough. Or that it's a thing to um, fix even, right? Right, Which is not right, exactly. Yeah, and, and, and so that was, a, that was a tough thing for us. Like we, we didn't know how to, how to fix that problem. And so you, you had this great suggestion of bringing in disability consultants um, which if you had asked me before, I would say, no, I don't need that. Like I can, I can figure mm. that out. Um, but I, but I couldn't, uh, and we couldn't, and, and we had these consultants come in and it was really wonderful to just, uh, give them a chance to read the book and provide feedback. Um, and, and they gave, they, you know, and, and it was unadul unadulterated, right? Like we just gave it to them and said, what do you think? We didn't, we didn't signal for them. This was the problem, but they all flagged. Uh, the same problems, um, and and we got some great suggestions on how to how to tell his story authentically um, without without falling into those traps and, right. and without really telling through like an ableist lens, which was very easy for I think all of us involved who um, are from you know who are able bodied and, and didn't think about our own biases. Right, exactly. And, and one of the challenges is for Jessing himself, right? As we talk to him through the process, he does, he's, he, he's now able-bodied uh, in a way that he wasn't as a child, right? So uh, he doesn't think about his disabilities the same way and he doesn't give them the same sort of weight. And so um, mm -hmm. what do you do when you're trying to tell someone's story about disability when they don't even see it um, that way themselves. I, yeah, there, there were a bunch of complexities around it, and I learned so much through that process. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this this question of um, of how we think about disability, it's it's also interesting because it changes over time. Uh, you know, Fuad Jessing, who was born over a hundred years ago uh, in a village in in Punjab, um, he didn't even know precisely. Uh, what his disability was. He didn't have a name for it. He didn't have a diagnosis. Um, and, and that's so different from how we think about disabilities today. And, and you know, that, those conversations are, are evolving constantly, right? Like 10 years from now, we will be thinking about disability different than we are today. And so I'm really interested to hear you, to hear you talk about um, what does it mean to, to publish books Mm -hmm. um, knowing that how we think about these ideas will change over time. Mm -hmm. That's a great and difficult question. I think it's something that um, probably all publishers and editors think a lot about today, especially when we're trying to be better as an industry about representation, right? And um, we can't prevent ourselves from telling the stories that we need to be giving giving space for the voices who want to tell stories by feeling like we might get it a little bit wrong. Like there's always a thing of doing the work. I'm just assuming that as a baseline that you do the work that uh, it, people are telling, telling their own stories, that there's a, a level of authenticity and rigor to the research, all of that. That said, you're totally right. Things are going to evolve in time. And I'm sure there's going to be so many um, books we've worked on or things we've said or things we've thought that you'll kind of look at later and be like, Oh, how that's evolved. And I imagine my, my guess, and I think my hope, is that I'll probably be faced with a moment of sort of shame, like from an ego point of view, from like a micro ego point of view, there'll probably be a moment of sitting with it and being disappointed with myself for not doing it better 10 years in the past, right? But I think on like a macro level, the thing that it will that this experience will tell me is that as a society or as a culture, we've evolved in our, in the way that we're talking about all people. And it's the opportunity for all of us to be rendered or to be viewed as we truly are as fully human. And if the conversation has evolved, then that's an overall win. That's a win for all of us. So I think I'm hope, my hope is that I will take the micro discomfort on my ego level and just let it be drowned out by the macro cultural win that's good for everybody. And I, and I think with that, we march on, you know, and that's, that's kind of where I sit with it now, but I'm sure, you know, 10 years, we, we should come back, we should type time capsule this question and come back and say, 
how was it? Uh, and how, and how are we really reacting? But that's my hope for my future self. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Sibrin. This is why this is why you do this work. <laughs> Um, all right, well, Simran, thank you so much for spending this time. It was so lovely to talk to you, as always. And um, I guess we'll catch up again soon, I hope. All right, thank you, Namrata. I appreciate it. and enjoyed right. it, too. Bye. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.